That's right. Welcome in. Welcome back, everybody, to the Fiesta Bowl preview edition of the Always Irish Show. As always, you can find the program on YouTube. Do hit subscribe if you haven't yet. I'd appreciate that. Give the video a thumbs up upon its completion. If you happen to approve of the content, I'd appreciate that as well. Twitter, search bar, always Irish, or at JKZND4. Emails, always Irish, ND, gmail.com. Audio only, anywhere you want me, you can get me. Call in number 312-988-15. On New Year's Day morning, when your head feels like it's been slammed into a wall, you give always Irish a call. I do have one update, though, that's a little bit unfortunate in regards to the ASX Always Irish Bowl Challenge, the game between Notre Dame and Oklahoma State that I talked about last week. We can still run the testing. However, being as honest with you as I can, there are some back-end issues and complications going on with the app to the extent that we made the decision we're not comfortable offering cash if we can't 100% verify all the calculating and the results and the back-end tech that all goes into this. So I can't offer the money just out of good faith. We don't want to present the game as something it might not be if everything isn't perfect. So here's what we'll do. Instead of the money to make up that ground, I'm going to put more in on my end personally. We could still go in and play the game and I still want people to learn it. We're still trying it out. I'm going to put more Always Irish and Notre Dame stuff in here to balance that out. So everybody should still play. And then if you win, you're going to get a lot more physical Notre Dame and Always Irish stuff. So full transparency on that. Promise that to you guys at all times. Just not comfortable with where we're at to run it with money. Just being as honest as we can. Okay. So with all this big picture stuff going on the last month in Notre Dame land. It almost feels like we've overlooked that there's an actual big game to win here coming at us quickly. Life comes at you fast, Mr. Marcus. It's like, by the way, congratulations. Everybody loves you. You're doing this media tour. You're, you're the talk of the town and all that. And your first game is in the Fiesta Bowl in a major bowl game. We have a one damn near in my memory of lifetime. And oh, by the way, you're also not going to have your best offensive player and your best defensive player. But good luck. Life comes at you fast. If you actually sit down and think about it, our man Marcus is in a pretty tough situation right now. Here's the other part of this ball game. I run my mouth about non-Power 5 teams all the time. And we lost to Cincinnati at home by double digits, a non-Power 5 team. I also run my mouth about the Big 12 not being that good. Now what? Now what? So I got shut up and proven wrong on the Cincinnati thing. Will it happen here as well? Because I talk crap all the time about not being a believer in the Big 12 overall. So am I going to take a double loss here and have to come back with my tail between my legs on this one too? We better hope not. The reality is, Notre Dame fans, the reality is with this ball game, the reality could be whatever you want it to be. Here's what I mean by that. This is emotionally, philosophically, existentially, if you process this bowl game, it is tricky. There's a lot of different angles you can approach it from. There's a lot. So let's go through a couple of these points. No doubt, Notre Dame desperately needs to win one of these games and end this losing streak so we can all stop seeing and reading and hearing and being thrown that stat in our faces. Winning this game would be a great springboard for Marcus. He could do something game one in Notre Dame that nobody's done since the mid-90s, early 90s. That, on its surface, is unbelievable. He has a chance game one as the head coach of Notre Dame. 
to get over a hump that we've spent over a couple decades worrying about and how many coaches and all their tenures we've gone through. He can erase all that week one, game one. At the same time, nobody can act like this bowl prep has been normal. So many moving parts. Marcus has had zero time to do normal bowl prep with all the obligations that just fell on his plate all at once, out of nowhere, unexpected timing. So here's the, the big question. If Notre Dame somehow should lose this game, who's to blame for that loss? It would definitely be a helpful reality check for Freeman that there's work to be done. The honeymoon's over. We're not good enough. So in that regard, that's the reality check of a lifetime. Bring everybody back to, to earth. Kill this honeymoon phase real quick. Game one, and it's a loss. But is it really Marcus's fault if they lose? Do you blame, blame Brian Kelly? Like, that's where this gets tricky. If you win, it's a, a just an absolute home run, touch them all every single way you want to. Cross off the bad history and all that. Good for recruiting, good for energy going into spring, all that. Keep that flow going. All that, that good juju, the good mojo, the good vibes everybody has for Marcus right now. But if they lose, that's where it gets tricky. I don't know who you blame. I, I, I just, I, here's what you need to do. Win the game so then we don't even have to worry about it. That would be most ideal. But I do think philosophically it's interesting because if they fall short, I cannot analyze that loss as if it was Brian Kelly and everything was as it was. Those are two totally different analyses performed through two totally different lenses that I see no correlation to whatsoever. So, yeah, it's Notre Dame. Yeah, it's our players. But if we lose this game, it, I do not look at it the same. I cannot question what went wrong and analyze it the same. The timing of all this has not been ideal while also understanding we're in a great position overall. Like, yeah, the timing's not ideal in preparation for this particular ball game, but overall Notre Dame's way ahead. No matter if we lost by 30 in this bowl game, totally worth it losing Kelly. We're way ahead. Big picture. But I just don't want to deal with these issues of we fall short and it's already going to be, oh, Marcus doesn't know what he's doing. He ain't ready. I don't, that's not fair. But I know some of that's going to come out from this fan base. So philosophically, that's where it gets tricky. If we lose, who do you blame for that and how do you process it? It's, it's a, I don't like saying this, but I do feel there is a little bit of house money being played with here. Maybe not so much locally, nationally. Notre Dame wins. Confetti comes down on Marcus. He did something nobody was able to do in 28 years, whatever it is. And if they lose, nationally, Marcus isn't going to take any heat. He will inside our unique fan base. Nationally, people are going to say, the guy's had three or four weeks to get his life together, being the head coach of Notre Dame at 35 overnight, literally overnight. He's had a lot going on. You can't judge him off this. But it's interesting. Who do you blame if things go wrong? Really think about it. You're going to blame the guy down in a swamp eating gumbo? I don't know. Win the game, and then we don't even have to worry about it. So here's where I think I want to start with this is of all the realistic bowl matchups once we were out of the playoff that we could have been in or teams we could have matched up against, I actually think Oklahoma State ends up being one of the tougher draws for Notre Dame. And no, it's not that I think that Oklahoma State's that great, but it's rather that I don't think that much of a lot of the other teams we could have matched up in in this bowl to make it easier 
to knock off that 28, 30 year, whatever the hell record it is of not winning any of these games. So that's kind of my initial processing after the frustration of not making the playoff is, well, we actually ran into a really, really good defense here. And a lot of the other teams we could have matched up against, I don't think that necessarily would apply. So here's a couple things I'm looking for. Number one, I want to see and be able to feel the new energy. We've, we've all talked about, seen, felt, heard, saw the videos. I talked about it in this show, that new energy under Marcus Freeman. I need to see that directly translate onto the field against Oklahoma State Drive 1, Series 1. I need to feel that the energy and vibe is different. No, not out of control energy, running around doing dumb stuff. Controlled football energy that makes me feel like I'm not watching a Kelly business trip in a major New Year's Six bowl game. That's the first thing. Next, the defense should pick up right where it left off. I expect a good showing from that defense. I just do. Even without Hamilton, I expect what they did to carry over from how they ended the year. Is there a little bit of concern about sloppy tackling and all that after time off? The same way I always have after a bye week. There is some of that. I am hoping the reports that it's been more lively and physical in practice than it had been under Kelly would negate some of those tendencies to be a little loose in tackling after a layoff. So I expect our defense pick off where they left off playing good ball. Special teams interest me with Nick Lazinski taking over for Polian. New position for him, new responsibilities for him. That is something I'm interested in keeping an eye on as well. However, offensively for Notre Dame is the part of this game that everybody finds most compelling. It's the part of our team I trust the least, have the most questions about. You don't have your number one playmaker in the offense, and you're going against a fantastic statistical Oklahoma State defense. That is the part of this I find most compelling of the whole ball game overall. Not even there's not even a close second place. Oklahoma State number one in the entire country with 55 sacks. That should wake you up right away. Number three in overall total defense only allowing 16.8 points per game, all right? The only two teams that give up less overall yardage in a game at 278 are Wisconsin and Georgia, a couple of really good defenses. Here's another question I have. What is the motivation level of Oklahoma State compared to Notre Dame? Notre Dame's energy level should be sky high, having all these guys want to play well for their new coach, right? Is that going to be matched by Oklahoma State? Or are they going to say, we were one inch away from probably making the playoff and we didn't make it and we're all depressed over it? Our defense coordinator left for Ohio State. Does that come into play? Could Is it possible, Notre Dame people, I know this is going to blow your mind. This is going to blow your mind. I don't think I've ever said this before in my life. Are we in a situation where Notre Dame, for once, might be in the more advantageous emotional position as a collective group than their opponent in a big-time game? It's wild to say, because I never would say that about any Kelly team, but I think that could help Notre Dame in this case. Their D.C.'s gone. They missed the playoff. They're all upset. I just think there's some different energies here. And I'm interested to see how that plays out. So, Oklahoma State, number one in the country in sacks, 55. They have five different players that had 10 
or more tackles for loss this year. Linebacker Ramirez, have your eyes and ears on him. Only allowed 2.7 yards per run, 26% on third down conversions. Number one in the country in that regard. Third in yards per play, just fourth in yards per pass. They're solid versus the run. They're solid versus the pass. Notre Dame will need to play well offensively to win this game. There are no gimmies. This is a good, tough defense against the run and the pass and overall. You got to play good ball to score enough to win this game. No, Kyron. Marcus has been busy and worried about the defense only primarily up until a few weeks ago. Tommy Reese, now's your time to shine, bud. It's not wait till next year against Ohio State. I could build out an offense the next six months. Now's a chance to shine. Boy wonder, Reese's Christ. Okay? Here's an angle for you. Let me propose this at you. See if this makes sense or if I'm just talking crazy. Has anybody else thought about the reality that Tommy Reese has a chance to sneak up on Oklahoma State? Think about it. Oklahoma State only has film on a Tommy Reese-led offense under the dictatorship of Brian Kelly. Not Tommy Reese on his own, left to his own devices. Now, I know that it's totally unrealistic to ask Tommy Reese to create a whole new offense in three weeks with all these moving parts. He thought he was going to be creating a new LSU offense for a few of those hours. It's unrealistic, and I'm not asking him to recreate the, an entire new offense without our best playmaker on offense. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think now's the time. You have any special plays. You have any tricks. You have a different set. You have a different personnel grouping. You haven't ran yet. Now's the time to do it. There's nobody putting on the, con the constrictors on Reese. There's no governor on him. Marcus is going to let him run the offense. Kelly's not around. Show me something exciting. Show me some stuff you kept in the bag and, and I've never seen. Because the opportunity didn't arise. Kelly didn't like it. Whatever. Reese has an opportunity here to take advantage of the fact that none of this film that they've been studying is with him in full control of what happens. I want to see an efficient, balanced attack with some surprises. Now is the perfect time to do it. You got to be good in this game offensively to score enough to win. You're going to have to be good. I like that challenge. Use Tyree. Use Diggs. Use Mayer. Use these receivers. Let's go. There's no better time than now to start planting the seeds of an exciting, futuristic, modern offense. Now, here's the worst case outcome right? The best case is we can move the ball with a balanced attack. Offensive line holds up, doesn't add to that 55 sack total Oklahoma State brings to the table, right? We win the game. I don't care if it's by one or by 50. You just got to find a way to win this game and end this stupid losing streak, right? That's the high-end plus side in this ball game. Here's the worst case scenario to me. The offensive line can't protect well enough to let Cone be good. And you all know Cone's not going to tuck it and run it and all this chaos and all that. No, he needs a clean pocket 
to be able to help this team. We all already know that. Worst case, the offensive line can't protect for Cone. Therefore, Cone is ineffective. They go to Buckner to, for a spark after things don't work at all for two or three or four drives. Now you're buying the eight ball. Now you're feeling that pressure. Then they go to Buckner. Then what happens? Everybody knows it's Buckner. It's going to be run-only packages, and that doesn't work either. That's the worst-case scenario is that the cone offense doesn't work because the line can't protect long enough. He's a statue sitting duck back there. Then they try and open it up with Buckner, but it's all running plays. And then they cover everything, and then they shut that down too. And it's an ugly ball game that we're all mad at. We hate. That is the worst case scenario. So if that cone offense isn't working and you go to Buckner, fine. But you're going to have to allow him at least the present the threat that he could throw a pass. Or, or that's not going to work either. So that's the worst case. Go into the other guy, and then it's one-dimensional, and that gets shut down too. So let's just hope that we can avoid that situation. So good line play. You're going to need to be balanced to beat these guys. You're going to be able to need to run it and throw it. Tommy Reese, the time is now. I'm looking at you. It's your show this week. It ain't the Kelly show. It ain't the Freeman show. It's the Tommy Reese showcase. No shackles to all you. Come up with something that works. We need it. Now, defensively, this is a totally different story. Notre Dame was really, really rock solid ending the year on defense. They really found their rhythm, really found their flow. Had a bunch of guys step up for a defense, the middle of it especially, that was ravaged with injury. All that thin on the back end. Despite all that, Notre Dame played really good defense most of the second half of the year, other than what they let Sam Howell to do, which I'm still mad at. Okay, But moving on, defensively, when I'm looking at Oklahoma State, I pulled up their stats, like their national stats. I'm not impressed at all. Now, I know them being able to get their running back back that was hurt for the conference championship game is a big deal to their offense, and they're really screwed without him. He looks to be back. I don't know if he's 100% or not. That's something to monitor. But when I look at their stats nationally, offensively, they're not near the top 25 in any category I care about. So this is a team that wins their games on the strength of their defense, even more than Notre Dame does some years. Oklahoma State relies on that defense to put that offense in positions to score enough to win games. Okay, but I am not impressed with their offense in any statistical measure at all. At all. We already went over. I'm a little concerned about the tackling and crispness and the angles. I'm concerned about that after any layoff. A bye, first game of the year, bowl games. I'm always going to be concerned about that. But here's the biggest factor that determines this game to me. Turnovers. Their quarterback, Sanders, has six interceptions in the last two games. And I believe four of them came in the conference championship game. We need that again. Notre Dame is plus nine, 19th in the country in turnover margin. Pressure, 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 pressure. Foskey, 10 sacks, crank it up. Let's go. Pressure, pressure, pressure. By far. The easiest path to victory for Notre Dame is to get pressure on this quarterback, make him throw you the ball, 
or you're sacking them, tackles for loss, they're off schedule, they're screwed. Crank it up. No big chunks. Do a good job against the run. All the usual stuff I expect to see from a Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame defense in general. So I know that's so oversimplified. Oh, all you need, yeah, obviously turnovers are a big deal. But especially in a matchup like this, that most people expect to be more low scoring with two good defenses matching up more than ever. The, that pressure, those tackles for a loss, and those strip sacks and interceptions are a big, big deal. This quarterback will give you the ball, but only if you make him. You got to earn it. Rattle this kid. Get after him. This It's so straightforward defensively for Notre Dame to me. Be good at the things you're normally good at, and you're going to be in position to take advantage of this quarterback. Four interceptions in his last game. Get in this kid's head. Do your normal stuff right. Stop that middle run. Tackles for loss. First guy that hits a guy tackles him. He doesn't get a bunch of extra yards like USC did after the bye. None of that. Pressure this kid and he'll give you the ball. That is the easiest path by far. Get after this kid. Crank it up defensively. That is the key to this. Because statistically, their offense doesn't impress me at all in any way. In any way. No. So, that's the path. You got you to gotta get the ball from this kid. Make him give it to you. He will. You just got to get in his face, and I expect us to do that. So, defensively, the recipe's easy for me. Be who you are. Cause those takeaways. We mentioned, and I'm going to mention it again, defensively, obviously, Polian's out. Nick Lazinski in charge of special teams. What do I need to see? No miscues. Like, I'm not asking for a lot of extras out of Nick. It's his first time coaching this position. Only been there a few weeks in, in that position. Been in Notre Dame longer. But in this position, only a short amount of time. No miscues. That's all I'm asking. Play a clean, tight game on special teams and I'll be happy. All right? So, I fully expect the Notre Dame defense to do a really good job, borderline shutdown job on this offense. They're not a good offense. So, the defense needs to shut them down, make some plays, find any way to win this game by a point. This is a certain games I'd say on my show. Depends the situation and who it's against. Certain games does not matter to me how many you win by. You just got to find a way to win. This is one of those games. Notre Dame just has to find a way to get off that big bowl game schneid. I don't care if it's by one or 50. Find a way to win the game. Okay, Mr. Reese. I think I'm not going to say most of this comes down to what he figures out. But it's, it's where my microscope is. It's the most important dynamic of this game. How's our offense going to be able to move the ball against their really legitimately top three defense, top five in both running and pass defense? Tommy Reese, it's your time to shine. It's your time to put a stamp on this offense. It's your time to let all of us see this is going to be a new age and a modern era. I want to see a good offensive plan that we can operate in, win this damn game. 